In this video, we'll be looking at an overview of the whole of uh, the immune response that we have in our body. Um, so in chapter 12, which is all about the communicable diseases, uh, I've spent a couple of uh, different videos talking about the separate parts of an immune response. So we've got the non-specific ones and the specific ones as well, and we've got different types of non-specific and specific responses. And in this video, I thought it would be quite good if we just kind of summarize everything and just pull everything together uh, to look and see how the entire body works together to, to make sure we fully understand the entire full complete immune response right so uh, actually the immune response is kind of like a story and it's got four different parts to it so we got uh, inflammation as the first step then phagocytosis then uh, the specific ones cell mediated and humoral responses and obviously we got the afterwards which is about how do we stop the whole immune response which i'll also talk about here in a second <clears throat> so we're going to first of all start at the first stage so uh, in the beginning, remember, we've got the physical defenses, so our primary defenses, which are kind of like our skin, the sebum on the surface of our skin, uh, mucus in our airways, and uh, if we have a wound, we've got the scab over it, and also if it's in our food, then we've got the acid in our stomach to actually kill these pathogens. So we've got the physical primary defenses. However, if the pathogens manage to get through these physical defenses and get into our bloodstream, into our actual body system, then the first thing happens, which is inflammation, right? So when the uh, infection started, first of all, there's a type of cell that is activated, which are mast cells. So this little symbol here stands for the uh, activation, right? So our mast cells are activated and they release two different chemicals, which are histamines and cytokines, right? There are two major effects of histamines, and both of which are also affect the blood vessels. They make uh, they dilate the blood vessels, and also they can make the blood vessels uh, more leaky, so the walls are more permeable. And uh, because of these uh, two effects, they can uh, it leads to show the four different symptoms of inflammation. Because of the dilation of the blood vessels, or you can call vasodilation, uh, it will lead to two specific symptoms localized heat and redness. So uh, the point of having a localized heat actually is by increasing the temperature, uh, pathogens uh, reproduction rate would slow down, right? They just naturally don't like to be in a really warm temperature. And the redness obviously just shows that because dilating the blood vessels would mean that more blood is flowing to the surface of the skin, therefore uh, it shows a, a sort of a red patch on our skin. And the point of that is actually by bringing more blood to uh, those infected areas in the inflamed area then uh, we, the idea is about uh, making the blood vessels more leaky is so that we can make uh, more tissue fluid right and the idea is that because they're more leaky some of the other um, molecules can also come out that naturally stay in the bloodstream so for example white blood cells is the main one right so the white blood cells are normally quite big uh, so they can't squeeze through. Uh, and also we'll talk about in terms of phagocytosis, there are specific uh, white blood cells that can go out and some that stays in there. But the idea is that you increase the tissue fluid so you're bringing more of the chemicals to that inflamed area so that they can tackle it. And the two symptoms here will be swelling and pain because obviously if you've got more tissue fluid there, it's squishing onto uh, the pain receptors, obviously then you feel the pain and also the swelling is because you've got more fluids there. And then on the other hand, we've got the cytokines, which actually attracts phagocytes. And obviously, because they uh, attract phagocytes, that's why we say that they would lead to the second stage, which is phagocytosis. So we'll talk a bit more about that now. Now, actually, there are two types of phagocytes, right? Remember that anything that ends with C-Y-T-E usually is talking about a cell. And we've got two different types of phagocytes, both of which do phagocytosis. Uh, one of them is called neutrophil and the other one is called macrophage and they have distinctive uh, structural differences between them even though they pretty much do the same thing. So on the left hand side we've got the neutrophil, on the right hand side we've got the macrophage. As you can see from the picture there are a couple of differences. Number one is the nucleus. So neutrophils have a lobed nucleus and macrophages have a larger round nucleus. And what that means is that the neutrophils are able to squeeze through the gaps in the blood vessels to leave the blood vessel. So when we talk when we talk about histamines making the blood vessels more leaky, actually it's about making more neutrophils leave the bloodstream to uh, directly engulf the pathogens at the infected tissues. Whereas macrophages mainly stay in the bloodstream. But the, the thing is they have a very, very important function. Right, so uh, the other thing is you will notice that both of them have one thing in common in terms of structure, which is the lyso, uh, lysosomes, right? So both of them have lysosomes in there. And 
the lysosome is basically a, a specialized vesicle that contains enzymes, like various hydrolytic enzymes, which which we just call lysozymes. But actually, lysozymes is just talk about the group of enzymes which are proteases, lipases, and carbohydrates. Because we know all pathogens, or all, all living cells, or living beings, are just made up of proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates. So, lysozymes, hydrolytic enzymes, are literally just a mixture of all of those enzymes. So both of them have that one. Then the other thing that the macrophage has, but the neutrophil doesn't, is that they've got the MHC, which is the major histocompatibility complex. Right, so the neutrophil doesn't have them, but then the macrophage does, because um, the idea is that the MHC, the major histocompatibility complex, is a protein that can turn the macrophage into an antigen-presenting cell to alert the rest of the body about the uh, about this invasion of the pathogen. Whereas neutrophil literally just do phagocytosis; they don't do anything else. Right? They just literally digest, engulf, digest the pathogen, and that's it. So that's why the neutrophils can actually digest. A, uh, you know, a pathogen in about 10 minutes, whereas the macrophage will take a little bit longer because it's not just digesting the pathogen, but also keeping the antigen and then present it. So if we look in the actual process of that, uh, of how macrophages does this, uh, as, as follows. So in the beginning, this is the engulfment of it. So we say actually, this is the pathogen and we've got some antigens on the surface of it. Sometimes these pathogens can be tagged by chemicals called obsidants. And these obstinates are actually antibodies, and what they do is literally tagging the pathogen and making it a little bit more obvious for the macrophages to mop them up. So r rather than just have, it's almost like playing hide and, hide and seek in the dark. So if you're, if imagine if you've got a gun uh, with uh, some sort of fluorescent dye and glow in the dark paint on it, and you can shoot around, and anyone you're trying to catch will. Uh, you know, be painted with that glow in the dark paint, so it makes it easier for you to catch them. Same way, in this case, the pathogens can be tagged by the obstinates, making them more obvious um, to the macrophages to engulf them. So, this is the case. So, they extend their uh, cell membrane and their cytoskeleton to engulf the pathogen. Make sure you use the word engulf and not eat because they do not eat. Things. They don't have a digestive system. They engulf the pathogen, and then uh, the pathogen inside will turn into uh, the vesicle that contains the pathogen. Will be called a phagosome, right? Anything that ends with S O M E is pretty much a uh, vesicle. And we've got the lysosome here, as we mentioned earlier, and then these two vesicles will then fuse together, and then we've got this big uh, particular. Uh, a vesicle, which we then called a phagolysosome. And I think that's kind of obvious why, because it's just the phagosome and the lysosome attack, uh, combining together, making a phagolysosome. Then we've got the MHC here, which we mentioned earlier, and then finally, the lysosomes would digest the pathogen except for the antigens, and then the antigens will be combined with the MHC to be placed onto the surface of the cell. So here we've got the digested pathogen here, and there are different ways the uh, cell can actually release these uh, digested chemicals to out uh, towards the outside, or they actually change all of this into something useful for themselves. Because remembering the digested pathogen is literally things like amino acids, glycerol, fatty acids, uh, sugars, simple sugars, etc. Because that's what makes up the cell, right? So then um, the uh, macrophage now becomes an antigen presenting cell and then they can then enter or signal the rest of the body about this particular invasion and then turning this whole response to a specific response because up until now the inflammation and the phagocytosis can literally be any pathogen and then it's at this point then they tell the body okay it is this particular pathogen that is infecting you um, so therefore we need to try to make turn this response to be specifically towards that particular pathogen and this third stage is cell mediated response. So the first thing is that uh, the we've got different cell, uh, white blood cells here, or we call them lymphocytes. 
so we got the phagocytes, which are the neutrophils and the macrophages. And actually, for the lymphocytes, we've got so many different types. There are two major families. We've got the T lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes. T lymphocytes, uh, they are made in the bone marrow, but then they are matured in the thymus. That's why it's got a T in it. Whereas B lymphocytes are made and matured in the bone marrow hence called the B cells. So the first one will be the T helper cells. And the reason why the T helper cells can do this is because they've got a very specific receptor as shown here. And this receptor is called the CD4 receptor. And the CD4 receptor is specifically going to recognize the antigen uh, MHC complex here. So they recognize the antigen MHC complex specifically, and then that activates the T helper cell in order to do loads of different things. One key thing that it does is to release a very specific chemical. Uh, actually, it is a type of cytokines, uh, but then because it's by the T lymphocytes, we call it the interleukins. But keeping in mind cytokines are like a family, so as mentioned earlier here, cytokines are a family of chemicals that are responsible for cell signaling. So how, for example, here it can signal the phagocytes to uh, engulf pathogens, and in this case, a specific type of cytokines, which are interleukins released by T helper cells, can signal other cells to do uh, various different functions. So first thing is, by uh, because of this activation, it would uh, trigger the T helper cells to start dividing by mitosis and also specializing into various different uh, other types of cells. So first of all, it can make T memory cells, which will be responsible for the immunological uh, memory for a secondary response. We'll come back to this later. They can also make T killer cells. And as the name implies, uh, they kill the cells and they do that by releasing two different chemicals. So the, first of all, they release as a chemical called perforin, which basically punches holes into the cell or, or the pathogen. So it could be a pathogen itself or it could be a viral infected cell or even a cancer cell. Right, so they just recognize that cell being, uh, being infected or not self and has not got a self antigen but got a foreign antigen. They release a perforin to punch the holes in the cell membrane. Uh, making the cell lose its integrity so all the stuff inside comes oozing out and, and also they can release hydrogen peroxide which is a very toxic chemical and it kills the uh, kills the cell or the pathogens directly so the, that's T killer cells or sometimes you might have heard another name called cytotoxic T cells. Another T cell that they can make is T regulatory cell and they have a very specific function but it doesn't come we don't necessarily come back to this until later on because the idea is that the T regulatory cell actually suppresses the immune system. So the idea is that uh, it kills all of the other active uh, white blood cells that was previously used to uh, control everything. Uh, and the idea is because if the rest of the, these T cells or B cells uh, can carry on after the infection is finished, they actually go into overdrive and then uh, that will, they would start attacking our own body cells, which is what we call autoimmunity. Uh, so the idea is that they can prevent that from happening, but we can come back to this later on. So these are the three T cells that the T helper cells will then divide uh, and uh, differentiate into, which helps with the body in terms of the immune response. Another thing that they can do is to actually uh, signal the B cells to start working. Now it's probably worth mentioning that apart from the macrophages uh, becoming an antigen presenting cell, uh, the B lymphocytes can also do the same thing. So actually we can have something called the B uh, antigen presenting cell. And they similarly, they can present, uh, they can do uh, phagocytosis and then present the uh, antigen on the surface, which is again recognized by the T helper cell with the CD4 receptor. And the way that they chose which B cell can actually do this is it's very much determined by what kind of antibody they actually have. And this is what we call clonal selection. So for example, here we've got various B cells, right, or we call them B effector cells. And they all have a slight, they all can make a slightly different uh, antibody, uh, as you can tell from the different shapes. Uh, but the thing is, if we, if you pick a particular B cell that makes this particular shape of an antibody, it, which is not complementary to the pathogen, then it wouldn't actually work. So they need to find something that is complementary to the antigen in order for, in order for the immune response to actually be useful. So the humor response, the fourth stage, is about this 
basically split into two parts. The first part is the clonal selection, selecting the correct B cell that makes the correct antibody um, to be activated, which then they then divide and further differentiate into different B cell, uh, different types of B cells, and this is what we call the clonal expansion. And again, remember, it is by mitosis that they do that. So there are different types of B uh, cells that they can make, namely actually two. So one of them is the B memory cell, which serves the same function here, which is the immunological memory. What that means is that maybe the first time uh, the first time you've got infected, then you, your body can make a little bit of antibody, but then they very quickly get destroyed. But then if afterwards, after T regulatory cells kills all of the other cells, the memory cells will still stay in the system and they can recognize the pathogen, the same pathogen if they infect again the next time. And then they start making, uh, they trigger the whole response um, in a very short amount of time. So they make they can make a lot more antibody in a very short amount of time. And this is what we call the secondary response here. And then some of the other B cells, the B antigen presenting cell, can actually divide by clonal expansion into more B plasma cells. And the plasma cells are responsible for making more B plasma cells, which is what we call the clonal expansion. And the idea is that you're making more of these cells that can make the same type of antibody. So all of them make this antibody of this particular shape. So we would say that they make a specific antibody, which can then go on and target the uh, antibody, uh, go on and target the pathogens in the rest of the body to quickly wipe them up. So what's important now is to actually think about what do these antibodies actually do and the structure of it. So antibodies can also be called immunoglobulins, which are a family of uh, proteins that specifically recognizes antigens. Right. So usually they have this particular Y shape. Uh, you should know that. Uh, they are made up of uh, different chains. We've got the heavy chains, which is kind of the inside bit, and then the light chains, which are the two chains on the outside. Here I've drawn it so that it looks a bit like this, but actually uh, it should be two separate chains here and then two separate chains there. And they're joined together uh, in various places, for example here, by disulfide bridges, and uh, which obviously, as you know from biochemistry, disulfide bridges are the strongest type of bond there is and that that's why it gives it its shape its structure and making sure it works and then we've got the different regions we've got the variable regions on the ends of that so this part here can actually change depending on the type of antigens that you're meeting so a lot of people think thought that uh, the antigen will bind in the middle here that's because because that's how we often draw it in, in in a simplistic term but actually that's not the case they can join each antibody here can actually join to two different antigens at that very end there uh, but usually in the other cases we just usually draw it here for some the sake of simplicity so that's the variable region, and the rest of the antibody is the constant region. You should know what the structure is and be able to label the rest of that as well. Right, so the uh, antibodies or the immunoglobulins actually have various different functions. They can directly attack the pathogen itself. These ones in the middle are representing those antibodies, and then we've got the pathogen at the different parts. This is what we say that the antibodies are doing agglutination and we say that they are acting as agglutinins. What they do is actually, as the name implies, they're gluing the different pathogens together and what, that ha what they do is that it makes the entire batch of them a lot bigger so that it's easier for the macrophages or the neutrophils to come and mop them up by phagocytosis. It's literally about making the batch bigger. Again, using the same analogy, imagine if you're playing hide and seek then uh, all of the antibodies, it's like you're shooting, you've got a glue gun this time and you're shooting out glue and it's stuck all of those people together. So it's harder for them to uh, say hide under the table or you know hide behind the curtains because they're so big. So it's easy for you to catch them. So it's about making the pathogens stuck together. Then another thing here is one single pathogen, but loads of antibodies around it. We've already mentioned that earlier on, is what we say that they can act as opsonins as well. So by tagging the pathogen, making them more obvious for phagocytosis. Another thing here is, let's say we've got bacteria and it's releasing lots of toxins, then these uh, antibodies can directly attach the toxins and then render them useless or neutralize these toxins. So we say that they can also act as antitoxins as well. So these are four uh, major functions of antibodies.
So imagine that the because of the B plasma cells uh, rapidly producing all of these specific antibodies, they, which can do all of these different functions, then very quickly the pathogen is wiped out. That at the end, we'll come back to this one, we mentioned this before, the T regulatory cells kicks in. So I'm going to simply say that this is going to be the end. So the T regulatory cells then comes in, kills all of the other uh, all of the other white blood cells except for the T memory cells and the B memory cells, which we need to keep for the next time. So they kill all of the other cells except these two uh, to make sure that our immune system doesn't go into overdrive and start killing everything else. So here we're going to do a quick run of the entire process. So in the beginning, uh, you are, let's say, running outside, you fell over, and then you've got, uh, you started bleeding on your knee, and some of the pathogens got into your system, where some of the others were blocked by the physical defenses, and the scab starts to form over your wound to stop further pathogen entry. However, some of them already got into your bloodstream, so it starts to traveling around the body, but some of them, let's say, on the knee, uh, triggered an inflammation in that particular area. So the first thing happens is that the mast cells are activated by the entry of the pathogens and they release two chemicals, histamines and cytokines. The histamines will dilate the blood vessels and make them more leaky as well, which causes four, uh, which you will notice by the four different symptoms. So it feels a bit warmer in that particular area, which makes the pathogens harder to reproduce themselves. It will also appear red, because there's more blood flowing to that to the skin surface. There's also t more tissue fluid formation because of the permeability of the blood vessels. Therefore, there's swelling and also pain that comes with the swelling. And the idea is to make more neutrophils uh, a becoming able to come out of the bloodstream to do phagocytosis. On the other hand, the cytokines are a, a family of chemicals that are responsible for cell signaling. So they will attract the phagocytes, which then leads on to our second stage which is phagocytosis. So we've got two types, we've got the neutrophils and the macrophages as the phagocytes. Neutrophils can squeeze out and try and kill those pathogens on the infected areas, but they cannot become an antigen presenting cell. However, macrophages cannot leave the bloodstream, so they cannot get to those infected areas. However, they will stay in the bloodstream and become an antigen presenting cell to alert the rest of the body to have a specific immune response. So they would engulf the pathogen, which may be tagged by antibodies already, then forming a phagosome inside. The phagosome then fuses with the lysosome to become a phagolysosome, and then the enzymes inside digest the rest of the pathogen, except for the antigens, which then bind with the MHC to become an antigen uh, MHC complex, which is then presented onto the surface of that macrophage. Then the ma uh, that particular APC will be recognized by the uh, T helper cell because it's got a CD4 receptor, and this is what we call the cell mediated response. The activated T helper cells can then to do different things. It would release interleukins, which can then signal more T helper cells to divide by mitosis. It can also recognize any uh, B cells that have also done phagocytosis, becoming an, an antigen presenting cell, triggering the humoral response, which is the next part on the right here. So let's talk about this one first. Then uh, T helper cells can then divide and specialize into T regulatory cells, T killer cells, and T memory cells. Uh, T killer cells actually release chemicals to kill the pathogens, whereas T memory cells would stay to provide immunological memory by recognizing the same pathogen the next time around. Then uh, it can also, the interleukins will also travel to the B cells here and triggering them to uh, undergo uh, clonal expansion and clonal selection in the first bit here. So for the correct B cell is being selected uh, due to their uh, specific antibody, and then uh, clone expansion will then happen, making more B plasma cells, and also some of them become B memory cells, which can do the same thing as T memory cells. Then all of those B plasma cells will then mass produce the antibody, the specific antibody, uh, and they can then uh, do four different things. The antibodies or immunoglobulins can directly attack the pathogen or they can act as agglutinin so that they can be engulfed by the macrophages or the neutrophils easier. They can tag the pathogen as well, so they're acting as obstinance there. Or they can uh, become antitoxins which render the toxins useless. 
and then at the very end of it once most of or all of the bacteria or viruses have been wiped out then T regulatory cells comes in kills all of those uh, white blood cells and immune cells except for the memory cells um, and the idea is to suppress it so that it doesn't go into overdrive becoming an autoimmune disease um, and then the T memory cells and B memory cells will stay around the bloodstream and if the next time we've got the same pathogen coming in again, but live this time, uh, let's say if the first time you've done all of this is because of a vaccination, the sec second time it comes around, it will recognize them very quickly, skip the first two stages of the non-specific responses, and go straight into specific response by producing a lot of antibodies in a very short amount of time, killing those pathogens before we actually start getting those symptoms and start becoming sick. And this is the overview of the immune response.